All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's episode of Peak. We're joined today by Dr. Dina Al-Rafi, uh, who is an assistant professor at Duquesne University uh, with her areas of research in, um, I think, uh, terrorism and international relations. Um, you'll say more about that in just a moment. Uh, but as you know, we're interested in exploring the topic of human transformative ex experience. And um, uh, Dr. Al-Rafi was... Um, referred to me by a mutual student of ours, actually, who uh, saw an episode of our podcast and said, you got to talk to this other professor that I have. And she's amazing. She, she knows a lot about this field. Um, so we had a conversation not too long ago about this, and we decided it'd be a great idea to get together and to do an episode together like this. Um, so we're very excited to have you on here today, uh, partly because, um, well, mainly because you're a very cool person and you're very knowledgeable about what you have to say, uh, but partly because the topic that we're going to be talking about today, um, it's simultaneously central in a sense to an aspect of human transformative experience because it concerns the, the dark side of human transformation, if you will, mm -hmm. right? Uh, radicalization and terrorism and, and, and extremism and fundamentalism, uh, while at the same time, given the fact that our backgrounds have tended to be more in, in you know, in the, in the psychological realm, you're coming at this from a different pers perspective. So <clears throat> um, there is a sense in which we're going to be, uh, I, I, I anticipate this is what's going to happen, but we're going to be exemplifying what an interdisciplinary dialogue might look like today. Uh, so we're, for these reasons and more, we're very excited to have this conversation with you, uh, Dina and, um, Maybe at this point, I could just pass over the mic to you and ask you to introduce yourself and um, just tell us what you think uh, we should know about you. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Gary, um, for the for the invite. This is uh, this is very exciting. I really did enjoy our last uh, conversation, uh, and I'm really looking forward to it being a, a dialogue um, among the four of us um, here today. So, uh, you know, I, you pretty much said most of it. I think some of the additional interesting things uh, perhaps are things that are relevant to my study um, of terrorism is, you know, I come from a Middle Eastern background. I'm an Egyptian native. Um, I, I do focus on terrorism and political violence broadly, but I've been very interested in Islamic extremism specifically. And that's because I also come from a Muslim background and, you know, um, in sort of the beginning of that, that path, the research path and, and uh, you know, was triggered by, let's say, personal experiences, which got me involved into it. So, um, or involved with it. Um, so that's, you know, that's really the story in a nutshell. I've, I've really ha had the privilege to be able to live an, in different parts of the world and to, um, you know, experience some of some of the, the issues that we talk about today in very different contexts. Um, so a lot of a lot of my research and studies I actually carried out um, in Europe. Um, but again, given my my background, given the fact that I was, you know, born and raised in the Middle East and North Africa, you know, I've all, also been able to take away and apply a lot of what I learned to these contexts and then now in the U.S. where I've been for two and a half years. So it's just, um, I, I think it's, it's really broadened my perspectives. I know that I'll, some of my views have significantly changed as a result um, of these different experiences. Um, but uh, I, I have been very, very passionate about the question of radicalization specifically and radicalization into religious extremism. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, to talk about it um, with you. Um, I'm not from a psychology background, as I mentioned. Um, so I think there will be a lot um, that the three of you will be able to bring and sort of um, build on. Uh, this being said, I, one of the most exciting things I wrote probably was um, the social, a social psychological uh, view or perspective of radicalization. So I think it's, it's inevitable as, as a terrorism studies scholar that we are going to have to deal with psychology because there's such a huge psychological um, element uh, to the process that we'll get into a little more today. But um, yeah, very much looking forward to how this is gonna go. Um, really enjoyed the last conversation we had. So uh, let's get started. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, here's my proposition based on everything you've said, because you, you mentioned how, and uh, a good friend of mine, actually, um, she, she, uh, she's got this term, me search, she calls it, 
where a lot of the things that academics study are, are actually reflections of what's personally meaningful to them, right? It's, it's more of a journey of self-understanding. So mm -hmm. I, I see a very personal dimension to your research that you, you were um, uh, mentioning just now. I would love to invite you to talk more about that to whatever, whatever extent it's relevant. Um, I'm wondering if we could do this. As I was listening to you talk, I got very curious about um, what are the different sort of um, lessons that you gained along the way and the, the, the ways in which your own perspective on these topics changed um, mm -hmm. as it relates to your personal experiences and your personal uh, understanding of, of the question of radicalization and extremism and whatnot. Um, and also wanting to know how your theoretical endeavors actually inform your personal understanding of, of these topics. Uh, maybe what we could do to tell me what you think of this uh, is to start by, um, we could either start with the theory end of it and then move into the personal side of things or start with your personal narrative and then try to turn to theory and to see how that informed your personal narrative understanding of these things, which to me seems maybe a little more natural, but. Um... Yeah, I mean, those are tough questions. <laughs> um, I mean, the personal narrative is easier um, because it's it's simple, really. Um, the, so the, the, I'll, I'll give some context of the personal experience, but not everything. But, you know, part of it was the decision as a Muslim woman to marry a man outside of my religion. Right. And in the Muslim world still today, in many parts, that is illegal. Um, it's elites. It's actually legally impossible to do, but also from a Islamic legal perspective, it is forbidden. So Muslim women in many countries today are still not allowed to marry outside of the religion I chose chose to. Um, and that was, you know, I received a lot of pushback from my family. Um, they were very much against it. But some of the responses that I received from the my extended family at the time, I felt were very extreme. And it was that point in my life, you know, probably for the first time that I, that it became apparent to me that, um, wow, you know, there are some very extreme uh, responses, reactions, behaviors based on, on religion. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I was very, very much aware that we had religious extremism, but I had never personally encountered it. And because, you know, beyond or before that point, I hadn't encountered them personally, they didn't really mean much to me. Um, but I think it's always, you know, personal traumas or personal experiences that get people to open up their eyes to things. And, you know, and just keep, hold that thought because, you know, when we talked about this before, I made a point about, you know, the personal traumatic experience or just a personal experience that leads individuals to question, you know, views that they held or that really disturbs, you know, their, um, their view of the world, it plays also a very central role to radicalization, right? Um, so I could have gone both ways, essentially, is what I'm saying, right? I could have radicalized and become a terrorist, um, but I didn't. I decided to, to, to marry a, a, you know, a Catholic. But, <laughs> but, uh, but that, was, that was the beginning of that experience. And it got me to think, you know, why, you know, what is it about religious law? What is it about Islamic law, you know, that, that, that promotes such fear? Because there's so much fear, like, you, you know, you're going to go to hell. If you if you if you marry like this is this is a line that you absolutely cannot cross, and so it got me interested just in you know religious extremism in general, and 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 also personally the reason I'm so passionate about it is that I think and this is across religions this isn't just limited to Islam I would say, um, but you see you know very often religious extremism disproportionately impacts on women, and women's rights and women's freedoms um, to choose and so personally it was wow, I really, something needs to change here because it's not just, this is not something I'm experiencing. This is something many other women experience. Um, and sometimes it has far more violent consequences when they make a choice of stepping outside of their, you know, of that, of that sphere, right? And making a choice, uh, you know, to, to marry outside of the religion. So that was a personal, you know, aspect. Um, and then I sort of, you know, took it from there and went down the route of, you know, okay, so why is this happening? Um, who are these other different fundamentalist groups, you know, and started getting more into studying groups like the Muslim Brotherhood, which are an Egyptian creation, right? Um, um, and, um, 
and, and started looking into that and, and why is it that I can't do this? What is it about religion necessarily or certain religious interpretations that deny me from doing this? And how are similar, you know, other interpretations pushing people into uh, doing far more atrocious things? And so that's, that's essentially the personal narrative, right? Amazing. Let me jump in. I just have a question uh, to better understand your personal narrative. Um, at that time, what were you doing? Uh, did you completely change your career path in order to study uh, these topics that emerge uh, in some sense? Yeah, I did actually. So I was a, I was a, but, but here's the thing, as I was a business undergrad. And I, and I never really liked business. I always wanted to go into law school. And uh, my parents uh, refused to send me anywhere but Egypt. And, uh, you know, I went to English language schools growing up. So I speak fluent Arabic. I can read it. But studying in it is some, somewhat different. And law school at the time, to go to law school, public, you know, university, uh, you know, you had to take six or seven subjects in Arabic, some of them that were very complex, you know, uh, one of them was Sharia, actually, Islamic law, because that's a, that's a you know, um, one subject that you have to take when you study just law in Egypt. So, um, so I ended up in business school. So I wasn't, it wasn't really my choice. So I was quite happy that I'd found something else. Um, but yes, it, you know, it, it, it definitely, uh, I, I was just very passionate about it. Uh, and it was so interesting. I'm like, why would anybody study? But no offense to people studying business out there. I mean, it's my husband is, is actually a, prof a business professor, a management studies professor. So, um, another very good reason to leave the field because there's nothing worse than having two academics that study the same thing, right? <laughs> um, but, um, but I was like, this is really interesting. Um, and, and, and I think you, you, and I don't, and you probably, I don't know if you'd all agree with me, uh, but, you know, I think you're, um, you're always, I find you're always much better what you do if you're really passionate about it and there's some kind of personal connection. Right. And so that it was just so easy. It was such an easy transition. You know? Yeah, I, I can relate to your story in a number of ways, Dina. Um, but what you just mentioned, uh, my, my parents, and I'm Indian, they wanted me to study economics in my undergraduate. <laughs> so I tried, to be fair, I tried. I was like, okay, these, you know, these people are kind of my benefactors in a sense. And so let's play the <laughs> economics game and uh, not get very far at it. And ultimately just, you know, jump straight into a field that two fields really that I was more passionate about. So, yeah, I think, I think that probably resonates with all of us having the yeah. passion for what we, the field we're into. Yeah. Yeah, in Egypt, in Egypt, it's always like, look, if you can't be a doctor or an engineer, mm -hmm. um, because they're really the only things that are worth being, then at <laughs> least, you know, study something that'll help you make money. Right. right. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. You know, um, what I'm also hearing, and actually all of our stories, because um, I've shared a bit about myself too, that sometimes we're faced with the decision of either having to do what's expected of us, but then sacrificing something that is a personal value or, or importance to ourselves or choosing that route, the route that has a, a more obvious element of the unknown to it, which will bring with it all sorts of risks and maybe even reper repercussions. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, specifically in terms of how it'll be taken up by our society or our, our family or you know, our, our social cir circles or whatnot. And um, it seems like um, maybe all four of us here ha have, have had similar sensibilities and, and tendencies of uh, really following the Socratic path in a sense, right? Doing what you know to be good and true and beautiful perhaps, even if it results in um, like clashes of different sorts. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's what I'm hearing in your story as well, Dina, that this topic became so important to you that you found it the obvious thing to do to switch careers, right? To switch trajectories. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not sure what that looked like for you, if that caused, um, I know, uh, a, a huge change of plans or whatnot, but it, it, it looks like you're now where you should be and you're doing exactly what you want to be doing. Uh, mm -hmm. And you're good at it and passionate, which is, you know, one of the most important things. So. Yeah, no, I take, I take joy in it. It just, it, mm -hmm. it's easy because, because a lot, parts of it were familiar, you know, so it, once I started doing the research, you know, it, a lot of the, the ideas were very familiar. It was just in learning how to understand, you know, how they come together, you know, why they manifest in the way they do 
And then, so it was a theoretical aspect essentially, which is missing, which makes sense because I hadn't formally studied um, the topic. But once I got into it, it was like, okay, I'm very familiar with the context. Um, I just want to understand why, how, you know, what's, what's the problem, right? Uh, why is it that we, we have so much, and we do, we have so many uh, religious movements in general, religious political parties that tend to be, you know, by nature more fundamentalist. Um, so it's not like we have, I don't, you know, we don't have progressive religious parties. We don't, right? Um, very, very, very few. Um, why is it that we have extremist organizations? You know, Egypt has a very long history, you know, contemporary history um, when it comes to, you know, religious fundamentalist religious movements, um, militant movements. You know, the, the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood uh, in most writings on political Islam today is kind of identified as the contemporary root of modern jihadism in terms of the ideas, right? The, the evolution and the ideas that some of its main um, founders um, um, developed, yeah? And so some of, the, the, some of the biggest names, unfortunately, I always joke about this in my terrorism classes. Um, and I had one student who actually mistook what I was trying to say and, and went away saying, you know, Egyptians are terrorists. <laughs> and that's not oh. what I intended to say. But what I was saying in class was a lot of the really big names and many of the movements, both those, you know, the spiritual ideologues of the movement, but also those that are or were until recently, because he was supposedly was killed, you know, heads of Al Qaeda core are Egyptian, right? There were so many Egyptians. So why? Why is why did they play such a central role? But just, you know, so it was very familiar to me. It was very interesting because it's things you sort of in your peripheral intellectual vision, so to speak, you kind of, you, you've seen, you've, he you know, you've heard them growing up, but you don't really connect the dots until you apply yourself to, to the study of, you know, and then you're like, oh, all of a sudden you see, everything becomes clearer. You're like, oh, this, this totally makes sense. Oh, you know, that bus, that one time when I was um, driving and I saw a bus, which had, you know, girls that couldn't have been older than six year old, you know, six years old, fully veiled in identical white, you know, garb heading somewhere. They, that was actually, that was probably, you know, Muslim Brotherhood sponsored bus or, you know, that was going to one of the schools that they run. Okay, um, and that's really extreme. That's actually extreme for most Muslims because, you know, girls, I mean, typically, you know, you don't, women don't have to get veiled until they get their first menstrual, you know, cycle. So they start getting their period. So why are these kids, why are these girls veiled at the age of, that is, extreme. I don't care what anybody else, it is extreme even from the perspective of more conservative interpretations of the Sharia because the debate is still on as to whether or not veiling covering hair at all is a religious obligation. Completely different story. Um, but you start seeing these things. Oh my cousin who once told me you know when I was wearing perfume that I shouldn't because it provokes men right because it's so tempting to me. I never really registered until later, and then we actually found out when the Muslim Brotherhood government took over that he, him and his siblings were Muslim Brotherhood. They'd been closet Muslim Brotherhood. They were part of the movement. Um, and I won't give more, more details about them here in this, in this conversation, but it's just, yeah, it kind of makes sense. Okay, why, right? Why, why does this happen? And how does that, you know, how does that progress into more violent, you know, expressions of the same ideas? So it's fascinating. I, I just think it's fascinating. Um, because that's it's so a, present, you know? Well, I think that's just a natural segue into the theoretical um, work that you have done. Uh, what are the answers that you have discovered to these questions? What is it that fuels extremism or extremist forms of uh, reaction or backlash from ideologically motivated or radical groups and whatnot? Um, so maybe you could just tell us what you've learned. Um, yeah, so um, so this is, this is a... This is a difficult question, but it has answers. Um, it's difficult because context really matters. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. So the, the, there are similarities and there are differences and we kind of get into the similarities because I think the similarities are more important across the board, across ideologies, across different geographic contexts. But I think there are also differences. So how radicalization occurs and the reasons behind it and the factors that contribute to it in a country like Egypt or in uh, countries that are ruled by authoritarian regimes in which the political sphere in general or the, you know, the ability for you know, people to, to express their views 
um, among other things, is very different than uh, individuals that radicalize in countries where their freedoms are, are, you know, are granted to them, right? So like in, in Western secular countries where, you know, we're talking about democracies, they're not really deprived um, to a large extent um, of, of any of their freedoms. And so, you know, these, these, these contexts are very different. Um, so, so radicalization, one thing to understand about radicalization, I think another reason for why it's difficult before we get into the, the similarities is that no scholar will tell you that we've managed to solve the, you know, what is specifically the pathway to radicalization for individuals because there isn't one pathway. Uh, we have factors that we know come together, um, sort of at the micro, meso, macro level, if, if we were to use that structure, that come together in very unique ways for each individual. And, 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 and what makes it even harder is that some of the very same factors or many of these factors are available for far larger subsets of the population that never even think about it, that never go down that path. Um, so it's complex in that sense that it's a very individualized process. Mm -hmm. Um, at the same time, you know, some of the similarities that we found, Gary, and I talked to you about this um, in our last call, some of the similarities that have been, at least when it comes to contemporary terrorism, so sort of, you know, over the past, let's say, 15 to, to 20 years, um, which have become very obvious are, you know, we're really talking at the micro level, like at the individual level, we're really noting that there are, in, there are similarities in the identity needs that present on the individual level for all people that radicalize. Right. So again, they are also very common to all of us. We all go through, you know, we all have these needs, um, but there are unmet needs that seem to be very important uh, points of vulnerability. Right. And so I'll just sample some of these, uh, you know, based on, for example, just looking at profiles of um, individuals that travel to join the Islamic State um, in Iraq and Syria or those, um, you know, Let's just, let's just actually stick with those. Um, what we're seeing a lot is um, they lacked a sense of belonging in their societies and they wanted something, you know, they wanted to, to have that sense of belonging with the group, but they also lacked purpose, right? So we really see that stick out. Like they don't find purpose in what they are doing. And this perhaps actually relates to what you were saying earlier about us, right? You want to, to do something you're passionate about. Um, you know, you could be, and, and these individuals could be economically well off. Most of the time they're not. It's the biggest myth that, that terrorists are all poor. They're not, you know, poverty. There is some relationship in some geographical contexts between poverty and terrorism, but they're not. So, you know, for, to, to a very large extent, especially in the West, you know, you have, um, you know, these, these would be radicals, they, they are, you know, they have, they go, they have education, they're educated, they have jobs, but they're just lacking a sense of purpose. So you have, they, they lack a sense of belonging. They, they want something to be part of something bigger. They, they lack direction. Um, in many cases, lack, lack of self-worth. All of these, you know, identity needs, right, that are unmet that, you know, then come together with some of their other experiences or are shaped by the terrorist ideology that they're exposed to in such a way that the ideology then presents itself as being able to meet these needs through participation in the group, right? Does, does, that, does that make sense? So the, the framing aspect of the ideology is very important. Um, that's, you know, that's how it works for, for, for some of them. On the other hand, sometimes it's, you know, the ideology comes first. So you have, you know, uh, ideas, people get sort of indoctrinated into a specific way of viewing the world. And then that, you know, that motivates them into joining the group. This being said, you know, that, and that's what I found really interesting when I was, when I wrote the, the social psychology paper um, uh, a few years ago, back in 2013, like, we're so caught up on trying to figure out, you know, what are the, the political reasons? Okay, so many, many of these terrorists, they say, we don't like US military intervention. We were so against it. And we're fighting with Al Qaeda because we're really, you know, because we're fighting occupation in Iraq. Um, we don't like the US support to Israel, right? And so we're joining these terrorist organizations because they, in, as part of their narrative, um, you know, they're fighting back against states which support both authoritarian regimes, but also Israel, authoritarian regimes that suppress Muslims, da 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 Okay, but, um, but that's, that's one factor, perhaps a justification, it's, it's one factor that might play into it depending on where you are, but it's just, it's not sufficient. 
Um, and because many of us, you know, have the same ideas about politics. We don't all get up and, you know, pick up a knife and become jihadi johns and behead people, right? Um, and so it, it, it goes far deeper than that. So that's kind of where it, it seems to start. That was the common denominator. I mean, that's really what appears to me to be the common denominator. And then with all of these other things, whether it's you experience discrimination, which, which, some, which some individuals do, which sort of pushes them away from society and encourages them to look openly, you know, seek out alternative ideologies to which they belong that appeal to, their, to a common identity. It's a specific political situation. I mean, there's no, there's no way to compare between Palestinian suicide bombers and kids that leave the UK to join the Islamic State. Right, I mean, um, the, the lived realities of these two groups are so different to say um, the Palestine-Israel conflict, you know, weighs the same as a, as a, as a motivator for, for these two, um, even if it is a justification which is given. So that's, that's where it starts. And then it kind of, you know, it, it, the, all of these other factors then, then build on that. Um, it's, it's a very long-winded answer, but it's just, it's so difficult to, um, to minimize that. I hate minimizing, you know, I know sometimes people will try to be like, it's, it's just this, it's grievances or it's policies. It's the policies of countries like the U S like Israel. Yes. You know, they play a part, but, um, you know what, these issues weren't around when these, the same ideology was around 60, 70 years ago, the U S was not in Iraq. 40, 50, 60 years ago, and guess what? You know, political Islam has been around a lot longer. Um, the narratives adapt. Why are people still joining them? Um, so that's, that's just part of it, I guess. There's, yeah. clearly, there's clearly a lot of complexity here. And I hear you when you say that we shouldn't try to reduce it and uh, reduce it all to like one cause or two causes or anything. Um, yet what we probably do want to do, and it feels appropriate to try to attempt this right now at least, um, is to get a sense of what relevant factors are at play, maybe in a sort of theoretically systematic fashion uh, that leads to radicalization. And we could do that in a, in a disciplined fashion, I think, by turning to the paper that um, you had shared with me. I, ooh, I have it open, let me, um, let me see. Uh, in the meantime, though, I, I wanted to ask Suraj, because I know you're, you know, you're a PhD in psychology. Does, does anything of, of what I say about, you know, what, what I observe um, in my own studies, does it resonate with you? Um, I'll, I'll bring my background to bear on this. It actually is a little bit more than the psychology, but in terms of the psychological work that I've done, uh, terrorism was actually one, and violence more generally. Those are some topics that I took up uh, five, maybe six years ago at a conference, which is actually where I met Gary. And um, that was one of the issues that I was looking at. And uh, it, it is one of those ones that psychology needs to focus more on. Mm -hmm. um, so there was that, uh, there wasn't a huge showing at the presentation that I made, but nonetheless, it's an important topic. Um, if we take it somewhat out of the religious context and we pay attention to, for example, all of the ethnic unrest we've had in the US lately and all of the shootings as well. Um, those seem to me to be related topics in the sense that you have somebody who goes off the rails because they're frustrated with the mainstream society and their situatedness within it, or perhaps their felt sense of being outside of that society. I think that's probably more appropriate. Um, and so they systematically although maybe not entirely consciously, um, will try and other that society to the point where it's an object that has hurt them. And so therefore there's no guilt or remorse in what they're going to do to that society, which is for a terrorist to maybe blow stuff up for a shooter, it's gonna be to shoot people. Mm -hmm. And so um, in terms of the psychology though, the paper that you sent us before this um, social identity is it's a big uh, factor in that, I think. But there may also be, a, we may also need to speak of a kind of um, anti-social identity for these figures. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't seen that concept in the literature. I suppose the literature maybe needs that um, if it doesn't exist. But uh, for, for somebody to act anti-socially, I suppose they need a anti-social identity. And that's where it gets perhaps a little bit, um, a little dicey for us as, theorists mm. on these topics. 
um, because it's sort of, for us at least, I think it's sort of uh, new territory. But, but in terms of the social identity, I guess we can consider it like a negative social identity mm -hmm. uh, within the society for people like terrorists and shooters and so on. Yeah, no, I definitely agree on the negative social identity. I, you know, so much about terrorism is about socialization, though. I mean, terrorism is inherent, is, is really, it's, it's inherently about the group. And, you know, I was, I was, I, I said this in, in another setting, I think the other day, but one of the biggest large scale studies of, of um, Al Qaeda, members of Al Qaeda, um, which was carried out by Mark Sageman, um, referred to. So, if you're familiar with that work, he referred to them as, you know, a bunch of guys. And a lot of the work that, you know, what, what Mark Sageman and many other terrorism studies scholars have really pointed out is there, you know, it's, it, it really is about the group. People that join, they join because, you know, I mean, there are many, the, the cause becomes really important. They rally around a cause, but they're also very much joining for the others in that group. It forms a, a new collective identity that replaces other identities. So you're absolutely right in that sense. Um, are they individually anti? I mean, I think it's very interesting that you say, you know, on an individual level, they're antisocial. Uh, potentially, I would say, yeah, they, they are in the sense that, yes, you know, at some point, you know, radicalization necessarily means the, the demonizing and at its very, you know, extreme, the dehumanizing of the other. There's always another involved. And what we have seen um, in contemporary, um, uh, you know, profiles of, of, of radicals and with contemporary radicalization, that, that's what it's about. It's about, you know, dissociating from a specific collective identity, whether it is, you know, traditional, a traditional religious identity, um, or whether it is just your national identity. I mean, a big part of the foreign, you know, going to Syria and Iraq, many of the foreign fighters, they were burning their passports, they were ripping them up. They were completely dissociating with their national identities, whether they were French, British, and they were openly saying, we're going to become part of a new collective. But, it, you know, with terrorism, at least, I'm not sure if, you know, we can make the same parallels with mass shooters just because mass shooters by definition, they wouldn't meet the definition of terrorists in most cases, because at least as far as I know in the US, there's a very big mental health, mental illness aspect to mass shooters as far as I know, and that wouldn't meet the criteria for them to be defined as terrorists. However, you're absolutely right in that on a basic level, many of the same, um, you know, motivating factors, you know, the sense of exclusion from society or frustration or whatever, they're very much the same, they're shared, right? With terrorists, with normal people, right? I mean, right. and that's the point I was trying to make. Um, but for, the, for, for terrorism, it really is, it's a replacement. So, you know, because I think as humans, we are social beings. So we're always looking to belong, most, most of us, right? Um, and so, yeah, you develop an antisocial identity, but then that, that, that's only the start of a process whereby you're you're looking to new group membership and that new group membership then replaces your old one and with it comes then the ideology through which you start reconstructing your own experiences and 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 you know um and so no so i i i, I agree with you I, I find the anti-social identity aspect though interesting i don't think i mean you'll probably know more about this than I. I mean, there's been a lot in psychology which has written about certain personality traits and personality types, which are, right, potentially more susceptible to certain forms of violence, including terrorism. But um, in terms of how that fits into, I mean, I'm just trying to reflect on on what I've read. And I mean, there's, there's, I've never heard that term per se. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. I haven't either. And it was just, yeah. So I, this is just sort of my style as a theorist is to sort of spitball and then see something might work. It might not, it might yeah, not in this like case. And, and Gary might have more to say on antisocial from a clinical standpoint. I didn't mean to cross that border into clinical psychology, but um, I'm, I'm actually not aware of the literature on um, like the personality profiles of mm -hmm. terrorists. But if I were to uh, make an educated guess, it would be that they're probably more neurotic. They're probably less agreeable. They're probably less extroverted. They're probably less open to experience. Um, and I'm missing one. There's all there's five of those personality traits. Conscientiousness. Um, conscientiousness. Well, they're probably conscientious in the direction of being a terrorist, but of course <laughs> not in the direction of being a good human being uh, in terms of the actions they carry out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So you know some of the other some of the other tr traits perhaps not types or that were exhibited are, you know, high need for closure, 
um, right. is, is typically noted, um, high on various scales that measure authoritarianism, um, uh, narcissistic, higher levels of narcissism, although I think, if I remember correctly, that was more related to leaders of terrorist organizations as opposed to terrorists, the entire, you know, as opposed to, to followers. So, you know, it also differs depending on the position that is held by, by the individual within, you know, the organization. But yeah, um, so they have somewhat, yeah, that, that has been definitely written about, but not, not with the antisocial identity term, which is interesting. Now, that is interesting. Uh, you mentioned narcissism um, in, and, and Gary has some experience with, with this particular figure that I'm about to mention, but his name was Elliot Roger. And uh, he, was a shooter at the um, in the college town that I was in as an undergraduate, mm -hmm. and so um, a, a number of journalists noted that Elliot Roger displayed narcissistic tendencies. So I suppose there could be some antisocial element there because narcissism is specifically an antisocial trait, mm -hmm. uh, among other traits like maybe Machiavellianism, which would also be the authoritarianism. So I, I suppose there is this, there's an antisocial sense of it, but it's like the specific kind, you know, for narcissists, which you seem a little bit more reserved about that one compared to like authoritarianism hmm. for terrorists, but. I, I guess it would be, how is it geared? You know, I mean, yeah. if that's the actual personality, you know, how does, how does the individual then take, you know, these personality traits and manifest them somewhere? Cause they need to be, they need to be put to use, I guess, for want of a better term. Sure. And, and how do specific activities or specific groups, you know, serve that purpose better? Um, and, and I guess maybe that's, that's the question. Uh, to right. Make right. And you mentioned fundamentalism before. So I wonder if there's some overlap between like authoritarianism, narcissism, and that in the sense of, you know, uh, uh, as a terrorist, maybe the tendency would be to put their group above all others mm -hmm. and to say every other group is wrong. And in fact, you know, let's go purge the other group, which is like the sort of Nazi mentality there. So I mm -hmm. wonder if there's some kind of, uh, some kind of correlations there, but I'm not aware of that mm -hmm. line of research if it exists. I mean, there, there's, there's so much, you know, definitions Every, every time you know you're in academia, you, you you have this problem probably with with uh, you know terms with terminology and psychology too. But with us, it's always the issue of definitions. How are you going to identify what any one thing is before you can start looking for overlap? And so fundamentally, exactly. the term I throw it out loosely, and I'm aware that I'm doing this uh, because even within the in in academia, the field there isn't really an agreement as to whether or not that term should be used at all. Um, in relation to different ideologies because of its, you know, historical evolution, because of its roots with um, Protestantism, essentially, right? And so it's, it's, I say, you know, I, I, I would say, yes, you can still use it, because I think if you, if you look at, at fundamentalism as a I want to say mindset, I think, I think it goes beyond just a mindset, but there are specific criteria which you can, you can say, um, are characteristic of fundamentalism that can be applied across ideologies, notwithstanding its roots. And I think that I think the discussion is too tends to be too focused on no, we really shouldn't be using this. We should be. I'm like, no, th th there there are very specific criteria for you know fundamentalists, but you'd have to sort of establish that first. Right. right. Um, but you know, before then going on to say, okay, you know, what aspects of authoritarianism really do you see within? Um, you know, where's the overlap? Where do they differ? You know, are, are authoritarian, and what are you going to compare? Organizations, governments, okay, groups, um, you know, are authoritarians perhaps, you know, they share some of the aspects, or are they more practical in ways that fundamentalists tend not to be, which would be my, not having studied this would be my, you know, my assumption, um, just off, you know, off the top of my head. So, you know, questions like that. Um, do, do you typically see at the at the head of these organizations individuals that are more narcissistic that display more narcissistic tendencies? I don't have the answer to that because I haven't I haven't done the research in that. But I would assume probably yes. Yeah. But don't quote me on that because, sure, because sure. Think, yeah. But that's that's I mean that is that is very interesting. But I'm aware that kind of using terms here that I'm not defining. But <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> the mortal. What is it? The the um, yeah, it's a sin, right? In academia, don't just don't just throw out these terms without telling us what they mean. But you know what? Yeah. People can 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 do their own research. <laughs> of course, of course, of course. And, uh, but yeah. and 
And in social science, some of these terms are very contentious outside of the academic context and even within the academic context. Oh my goodness, yeah. You know, yeah. so so there, there are these yeah. more complexities to add to the table there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gil, did, were you wanting to also jump in? I, I couldn't tell. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the narcissism piece and actually part of the paper that you, um, uh, where you discuss where you discuss the two causes or the two factors rather um, that lead to radicalization. I, I think that was a part of the paper uh, where one of them, you mentioned how you, you tend to see, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know your pa paper the, better than I do, <laughs> but part, part of what leads to radical, uh, part of, so you see a greater tendency towards radicalization in second and third generation Muslims rather than in first generation immigrants. Mm -hmm. with the first gen immigrants they they're practicing a form of folk islam mm -hmm. versus uh, which is different as you argue than um the kind of approach to islam and islamic belief that the second and third generation um youth take which tends to be already colored or prefigured by the secular and enlightenment values mm -hmm. right um of, of of western countries and western cultures more generally um so what you see is a it's like a, it's, it's the same thing only in name, but not in structure that's there, right? Islam for the first generation versus the second and third generation um, youths, it's the same only in name, not in structure. That's the sense that I got. And the second thing that you uh, identified was that there's a, a, twofold, uh, a twofold loss of a sense of belonging where uh, on the one hand you have, um, Muslim youth in a secular state, for example, where religion is meant to be restricted or confined to the private sphere, which goes directly against how it's meant to be from the Islam, Islamic point of view, in that it's, a, it's part of the public sphere, right? It's, a, it's part of the experience of the public. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a rejection from society on the one hand going on, and because of the incongruence between right the second and third generation youth and how they take up islam which ends up taking place from the point of view of a secular sort of attitude um and the way in which their parents and their families um as first gen immigrants might be taking it up that leads to an alienation therefore not just from society but also their families so who are they left with okay narcissism so th that's the first bit. Now let's get into the narcissism bit, which is really interesting. And this is stuff I only recently started to read about. Um, but narcissism is, it's not just a maladaptive pathological personality structure. There's also something adaptive about narcissism. Uh, one of the scales, I think it's called the pathological narcissism inventory or something like that. Uh, it measures two constructs, both of which are part of narcissism. One of them is narcissistic grandiosity, I believe, which you could make the case as the adaptive aspect of narcissism in that when you rate high on all the subscales of that measure, right, you tend to be the kind of person who has a lot of um, self-esteem, ambition, directedness, right, self-worth, things like that. Um, versus the, 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 the vulnerable narcissism uh, aspect of it, which is that... Um, anything that could potentially threaten your sense of self-integrity or self-worth, you're going to sort of push it down or, or, or push it away because um, there's a kind of vulnerability that you have. Um, mm -hmm. A strong need or thirst for affirmation and validation from others mm -hmm. and, a, and a very low threshold for right, uh, criticism or critical feedback, something like that. So what we see, as far as I understand, is these narcissistic traits, they're not static, they're not things that you just have, but they're, they have a developmental history. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, as far as, I'm, as far as I understand, that actually goes back to your developmental history with, within your familial context. So mm -hmm. if you lack caregivers who uh, right, mirror the best parts of you back to yourself to make you believe that you're the kind of person who can do it, and who can do something good out there and who can do something that matters, 
right? You, you grow up with a whole bunch of holes in your psyche where you have a lack of self-esteem, a strong need for a validation, but an emptiness that always follows you around. Mm-hmm. And so you can imagine how in a culture or society where the family lets you down in this way, but there's the broader cultural milieu where mm-hmm. you can have friends and be a participant and member of social circles where you get that sort of mirroring elsewhere than your family. That sort of takes care of it for you. You still grow up, right? Mm-hmm. In a relatively integrous manner. But if you're a, an immigrant in a country where the culture is opposed to your own cultural background in, in, in basic fundamental ways, like at the level of religious axioms or whatnot, mm-hmm. and your family lets you down in these ways, then what are you left with? A strong need for group membership, because the point of that, the function of that psychologically, at least partly, is to build you from the ground up so that you can be a, a coherent individual, a relatively coherent individual, right? We're intersubjective first, and only then do we become subjects, right? Intersubjectivity developmentally precedes subjectivity. That, that's sort of the whole trick here. Um, so in, in, in cultures where, and that sort of makes sense, right? The way you've laid it out in your paper that you're, you're looking at um, situations where individuals have been let down by their familial context and society at large, which leaves them with a whole bunch of anxiety and uncertainty. And especially if there's biological factors at play at the level of personality predispositions where, uh, what, what is it that you said? One of the traits was need, a strong need for closure and then other things like that those all, at least to me, seem to be deeply related with um, your threshold for uncertainty, how well you can tolerate uncertainty and the anxiety that comes along with it. Mm -hmm. So if if you have a very low threshold for uncertainty, if you're low on trade openness, let's say, and high on neuroticism, Mm -hmm. and not very high on extroversion, maybe, maybe not, um, and conscientiousness, I'm not sure. I, I would assume that there would be a relationship there between conscientiousness and uh, radicalized personalities or personalities that are susceptible to this kind of radicalization because Mm -hmm. conscientiousness is um, partly related with ordering things and reducing threats so that you can fulfill your aims. So it is related to neuroticism partly. Mm -hmm. Um, I I can imagine with these kinds of biological predispositions also at play, uh, you, you could predict, right? those would be predictive of what kinds of individuals would be more likely to right, shy away or shun all the uncertainty and anxiety by turning to ideological belief structures, which are there to simplify the world sufficiently so that you can cope with it. Um, and if you get extra membership and, and, and group identity out of that, then so much the better. Mm-hmm. And if that means that you also get to paint the out group as villainous and right? Gain a sense of moral superiority, then so much the better. That sounds like a good deal to me. Why wouldn't it? If I am in a place where I've been left behind and let down by everyone, by the people who are supposed to be there for me. Yeah. You, you know, Gary, it's also, it, sometimes it's also not, I mean, part of it is being let down. I mean, in a sense, you can say, you can interpret it as such. Sometimes it's simply that the, the identities that are present don't serve you. Um, so I think par- part of what I, th- I was trying to communicate too there was, you know, it's not so much the family is letting them down intentionally as much as the, the, the model of religion and just the parents as role models, specifically the first generation, aren't really giving them direction that serves them within the, the societies, the communities they live in. They, they don't serve them within the secular context per se. So they, they you know, they're not, they're not providing them with anything. They don't serve them. And so, you know, they then, you know, turn, turn away from them. But at the same time, the, the, the double alien, the idea of double alienation was like, it was almost like, okay, it doesn't, religion doesn't really serve me. This model of religion doesn't serve me, but I still, in many cases, identify strongly religiously. And there are still certain religious um, 
uh, dictates that I that, that are very important to me that I'm raised on that that are that are irreconcilable with the society I'm in because of the nature of society in question so I don't fit in there either or when I do I kind of feel guilty about it I mean this was something which which you know this is something which comes up for example uh, among you know in, in the biographies of a lot of former radicals who for all intents and purposes up until they were in their teens you know late teens they were well integrated into their into their societies they you know they they had friends they had they, they didn't face any form of discrimination. Sure, they, they didn't necessarily um, relate to their parents, you know, traditional religious uh, perspective, um, but they, you know, they, they, they were well integrated. They had friends, they went out, they partied, you know, they drank alcohol. And for the most part, we have the former biographies of, of males. I don't, I'm not aware of any female uh, radicals, former female radicals that have written biographies. I might be wrong about this, but, you know, to me, they slept around. Uh, you know, and then they were just like, but they always felt a nagging guilt because, you know, in Islam, you know, drinking is haram, it's forbidden. Um, uh, partying is, you know, mingling, intermingling with girls. I, we really place a very strong emphasis on these things being wrong, sinful. And so another theme, it's not common to everyone, but it's something which I've seen a lot in studies that look at um, individuals that moved towards, you know, more Salafi interpretations of, of Islam um, in the West, which was there was this nagging guilt, which is, you know, I need to be more religious because my lack of religion integrating into a secular society um, is going against my religion. So there's this underlying sense of I'm doing something wrong, but at the same time, you know, the familial role model is not providing at all. It doesn't, it doesn't serve these individuals with a path to success, I guess, within society it doesn't help them integrate. And so they're just like, okay, if both of these aren't serving me, let's just completely dissociate, let's disconnect and let's find another group, which I, you know, which I can join, um, in which I am fulfilling my religious obligations, but, you know, which, which also has a more, is, is action oriented, which has a very clear, um, which provides a better role model for how I can live my life, even if that comes at the expense of, um, me being integrated into the society I'm in. It's not important, right? Um, and I think religious ideologies um, for the, and I'm not saying, you know, this, you know, I don't mean to imply that this is representative of, you know, all Muslims in, in, in Europe, or in the, this is not the case, but I'm talking specifically when you look at radicals, this tends to be what you find kind of in their, um, it plays a very important part in their pathway right, um, um, uh, to, towards radicalization, which is, you know, they, they get, they get the religion, but they also get most of these radical ideologies also come with a specific action plan. This is what you should, and this is what you shouldn't do to live the right life. Uh, they definitely come with the moral superiority because they're all premised on the idea that we are the true, we're doing Islam right, everybody else is doing it wrong. So there's definitely, so it feeds into that sense of, you know, you, you, they gain status. I mean, the gaining status was also, and I don't know if this might be tied to, to narcissism, the narcissism angle, but, you know, recognition and gaining status um, is also a very important aspect um, that has been noted among, you know, motivations, or at least maybe not motivations, but, you know, something which was very positively, um, I don't want to say received, but which, which was noted as being um, an advantage perhaps or something that these individuals that join these groups either desired or, or enjoyed, right? Or, or, or was noted. Um, so, so perhaps there's, an, there's, there's something to be said about that too. But uh, finally, the uncertainty, absolutely. I mean, we have so much uh, literature that has been written on just in general, all extremist ideologies, this is not limited to uh, re religiously motivated extremism, but all of them, you know, they kind of, they simplify things, right? So extremism and extremist I ideologies by nature are very black and white in their prescriptions, right? Um, and how they diagnose things, how they prescribe actions to solve problems. And that's what they do. They give that certain, you know, cognitive closure, but they also, you know, they deal with they just give you answers to questions that you can't find. And it doesn't matter whether they're right or wrong. It doesn't matter what they prescribe, but they meet that need. And, and that's definitely, there's, there's so much empirical evidence to support the idea that, you know, the more uncertainty that is introduced, um, the, the more open individuals in general are to, I mean, this is not just radicals, but accepting more conservative views to, to sort of becoming part of, of a, of a, um, a more restricted 
um, prototype of, of, of a social identity or collective identity. Um, and terror management theory sort of comes comes to mind here, uh, because this is you know this this also is very it, there's so many studies that have been done with when you introduce um, an existential threat or when you remind people of their you know mortality they tend to um, support more conservative positions more black and white positions I mean it all just kind of you know you know fits together so I absolutely I 100 percent agree with your with 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 your analysis there. I have lots of thoughts, but I'm going to just pause for a moment if anyone wants to jump in. Well, we've jumped into the existential now, so that's <laughs> it tends to leave a clearing <laughs> in my experience. <laughs> like segue into the existential threats. Yeah, right, right. Which terrorism certainly is one. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Terror management theory or terrorism management theory? <laughs> Um, so, um, I would like to uh, bring the conversation back to one of the first uh, questions of Gary. Um, he was uh, asking you what are the main factors that contribute to uh, the radicalization process in individu individuals. And um, I know that your studies uh, focalize in a religious context, but uh, I was wondering uh, what could we learn from other contexts? Uh, have you uh, researched like the factors that could be at play, I don't know, in a political context or an environmental context where we can also see some sort of uh, radicalizations? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. It actually takes us back to the existential threat, <laughs> because you know we talk a lot uh, now. The, the the in the news there's a there's a lot of um, focus on the the far right, yeah, and kind of far right ideology and 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 that's you know again if if I were to say I, I'm a specialist in anything, it's it's religiously motivated extremism. But you know having a knowledge of all the the different ideologies. Um, you know, for, for the, I'll use the far right as an example. And I think when you talk about existential threat promoting more and more conservative and extremist views, I think the far right is a great example, both in the US, but also in Europe. Um, so, you know, so the European context, um, what we have seen over the past few years, pretty much in response to a spike in um, migration, irregular migration has been, you know, also an uptick in far right activism in general. Um, I hesitate to turn it into, you know, to blow it out of proportion and say it's it's a huge threat. I mean, you've seen, you, you see far more um, legitimate populist, you know, far right political parties that have gained as a result, um, as opposed to, you know, attacks that have been carried out. Um, although there have been some certainly, um, you know, on migration um, centers, you know, immigration, refugee camps, immigration centers, whatnot. Um, but, you know, within the context of the far right, it certainly is at least according to the narrative, you know, the, the idea, the perception of there being an existential threat to, you know, what these groups perceive to be the native population and their native identity by these newcomers, which are the other, right, which, um, which are not native um, to the country, um, is really one of the, the primary animating factors for far-right extremism, um, both here in the US, but, you know, to use a European example, it, 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 this definitely is the case. And, but this is not new. I mean, this has been a, a long time in the making in the sense that, um, you know, the, the issue of, you know, and it's kind of reciprocal. We, we have this term that we use, in, which is reciprocal radicalization, because basically what we've seen in Europe over the past two decades, you know, after 9-11, pretty soon after 2004, 2005, European countries started experiencing or witnessing rather um, terrorist um, attacks um, all the way through to, you know, just a, a few years ago, I think France with the, the Bataclan attack experienced, it's, I think the worst, the worst terrorist incident in the recent history of France. And so there have been problems and, and incidents and to, as with all ideologies, what these movements um, have done and how they gain recruits to the movement is they've 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 taken these um, attacks um, as a as evidence, let's say, 
of an existential threat that is posed by those that, gener that belong to the same identity of the attackers, which is Muslims in general, right? Um, this is very, you know, I don't want this to sound simplistic because I'm not saying that there aren't legitimate problems from radicalization in Muslim diaspora communities in Europe, and there have been, but these, all of these issues kind of come together. They build on one another to the extent that, you know, the, the predominant discourse um, um, when it comes to just this issue among the far right, which is one of its main animating features is look, you know, Sharia is taking over. Like we have such large Muslim populations now, many of them are we have radical movements, which is very true. We have radical Islamic movements um, in some countries like the UK. You know, the UK allowed the establishment of Sharia tribunals, um, close to 100, right, in which, you know, sh you know Sharia courts um, have been established as kind of an alternative in parallel to, uh, you know, British civil law courts. And so it's kind of this idea of creeping, the creeping Islamization of, of Europe. And that has entered into the discourse, but it's presented very clearly as a threat. Like they are replacing, we are not able to, to integrate um, um, Muslims in general, as a discourse, as a narrative goes. Um, and, you know, with the emergence, we've had more attacks and we have these radical movements and, and they do. And so we are threatened, our values, our way of life is, is, is really under attack, right? And so to get back to the existential threat, you know, once you start introducing that, you know, into the narrative, whether you are a political party, which, you know, that, that does form part, you know, the platform of some of these, you know, political parties um, in Europe, but you know, with the far right, where it is, you know, we have to completely stop this. We have to stop more people coming in because they're coming in and they're bringing these ideas that are very dangerous to us. Um, you know, then already the divide between us and them, you know, it starts growing. And, 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 and that's kind of how it starts, right? Um, and I think, I think the, you know, this idea of feeling existentially or the reality of feeling existentially threatened is also, it, it, it's very potent. It has a very potent effect, if that's the right word, um, um, when it comes to mobilizing people for action. Um, it, so that's, you know, that's just one example. I mean, I, 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 the, the right, the far right isn't really an umbrella um, ideology. There are differences depending on where you are in the world. Um, the focus is on different things, different issues, depending on the context. But within the European example, you know, that I would say that that's how it works. Um, and then it plays on the same, you know, the, the same psychological effects that are that are triggered by presenting by introducing um, into the equation an, an existential threat to identity and then you know within both social identity theory and identity theory there's a lot which has been written about you know how people respond when they're that when their social identity or their collective identities that they hold you know that they are very c committed to when they are under attack um, it 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 makes them very hostile um, to the other, and it promotes of the othering um, of, of the groups that are that have been established as the enemy, right? That have been established as a source of um, that threat. And you see the same the same dynamic also in, in you know in genocide, like in genocide studies, and you, it's it's the same narrative. It's, it's, um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, that's just one one example from another ideology. Is it okay if I jump in, guys? Yes. This point. Okay, so this is really interesting because you've sort of um, gone beyond the, the the parameters of the paper that we read, uh, that the three of us actually read for today because we wanted to be a little prepared for this discussion, um, where you've sort of identified a level beyond um, beyond the, the identity dynamics that lead to radicalization at the individual level with respect to um, Islamic youth specifically in, 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 the, in the populations that you were interested in, of course. And you've sort of identified polarization dynamics, right? It, um, that, that emerge right through the reciprocal feedback of right an out group that 
is acting in a way that, uh, um, for, for the point of view of the cultural mainstream, let's say, because um, let's take Europe, for example, Christian majority and then Islamic minorities immigrate in and then cause a lot of distress and uh, existential angst and anxiety. And then um, th th that sort of leads to feelings of threat, which are managed through ideological sort of means uh, mm -hmm. by painting um, you know, the, the minorities in a negative light saying that they don't belong here, they need to go. And then that sort of feeds back into the right and, and, and pushes um, the radicalization that's going on on the other end of the right. spectrum, which then feeds back into this side. And what you end up seeing is, a, is, is an extreme sort of polarization on mm -hmm. all levels. And the common factor here is something like existential, um, existential anxiety or something like that at the level of identity. Um, it's just being managed in different ways, but despite the differences actually, what's happening is the emergence of ideological means of managing this, this kind of anxiety. Absolutely, absolutely. So you've sort of pointed to a different problem at this mm -hmm. point. And the, the problem is the problem of ideological polarization. Mm -hmm. What oh, we see absolutely. anywhere at this point, whether in the States or in Europe or you know, elsewhere. And it's interesting how this could be related to other kinds of populations and situations. Um, I'm thinking of incels, for example, and Elliot Roger, uh, the shooter who Suraj mentioned earlier, he was part of that community, uh, mm -hmm. which, uh, and incel stands for involuntary celibate. We, we talked mm -hmm. a little bit about this in our uh, initial talk, right? Uh, where, right, it's this, it's this group of individuals who feel it's completely let down by society and especially by the, uh, by the opposite sex. And um, the right women become the, the villainized out group and they form this community, which uh, is the in group. And similar to all these, these other extremist fundamentalist communities that we've been talking about, there's a sort of parasitic function that like, the whole raison d'être, as uh, as the French would say, right, of these communities, is to critique or attack or undermine or right to undo th their target, which is the mainstream mm -hmm. or the other, the out group. So mm -hmm. th th that's sort of what feeds or, or fuels um, the structural dynamics mm -hmm. of these these communities. It sounds like, yeah. um, and. Where I want to eventually go with this, actually, let me know what you guys think, is uh, bringing all this back down to the individual level, to our personal lives. Um, I'm sure you, you have some thoughts on this, but I'm wondering, what are the antidotes to these kinds of problems that each of us does encounter in the day-to-day? -day? Because we all have identity right, issues and struggles, and we all experience existential uh, threats and anxieties, and we all want to belong and sometimes we don't really um what, what would you say people could do more of in order to right keep that kind of ideological radicalization at bay as a possibility and to find a more fulfilling and uh, meaningful way to conduct themselves despite these threats that abound is that a rhetorical question <laughs> no he's shaking his head <laughs> This is like, how do we solve this problem? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it might be it, premature to even think about this, but I mean, I, I feel yeah. like you've sort of articulated the framework for this, uh, yeah. the different factors at play that could apply across many different situations, right? I'm not saying that they're, they're absolute, right? That they're invariant, but they're, they're quite um, cross-contextual. So there's mm -hmm. a degree of generalizability that your theoretical uh, labors have afforded us. And mm -hmm. with all that in mind, it, it feels... Um, I mean, I'm curious as to, like, if I were to find myself in a similar situation like that, what kind of person would I have to be and what kinds of things would I have to do in order to not fall prey to the problems that we've been talking about so far? That's the way I'm framing this for myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take, I mean, I'll, I'll get us started maybe with, with, with some of the ideas um, that have been presented sort of in the framework of countering violent extremism or preventing it, um, that, that respond directly to this issue of you know, individual identity needs and how we can sort of fight back against the, the need to, to resort to 
um, ideologies to solve or to address some of these problems. And, um, you know, I would say if, if you can locate the problem as to one of the, the main problems or one of the main sources being the inability to contend with, you know, different ideas um, and and the you know the inability to be able to 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 to, to I don't want to say balance but to, to critically approach the information because there's a lot of information there's a lot more information um, that that people that, that, that this generation right and these generations you know deal with as a as a result of you know things like you know social media social media exposure um, there's there's quite a bit that's been written about this. Um, uh, you know, the impact of, you know, the social media uh, generation on identity formation and some of the, the issues that are attached to it. But, you know, fundamentally it is, you know, tr addressing this, this issue, which is young, young people. I mean, if you're going to focus, you know, on young people, you know, to begin with that seem to be more and more having these issues, um, then perhaps one of, one of the things is teaching individuals to be able to um, think critically. Right to be able to, to critically address um, the information that they receive, but also to be able to be more reflective. Um, I'd mentioned to you this book, The Coddling of the American Mind, Gary, um, a couple of weeks ago, which was uh, Jonathan Haidt, and I, and I can't remember, Greg, I can't remember his last name. Um, but he really touches on a lot of, 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 of the issues that, that we kind of see leading to the same, both the polarization, ideological polarization, which in many case studies he gives in this book, he shows how that leads to violence, right? It's the simplification, this need to simplify, to see the world increasingly in black and white as a way to, you know, respond to these existential anxieties and to respond to this information overload. But pretty much everything I've seen that's written on identity is telling us that we should be doing the opposite. Um, we should not be, uh, you know, trying to, to to give, you know, people to give individuals, you know, easy ways to understand the world because it's not easy. We should be giving them the tools to be able to, instead of, you know, think less and think in boxes, to actually be able to step out and, you know, um, take in the bigger picture and and be able to, to reflect on it and to to critically, you know, um, and so and and this is this is something which has some empirical support um, in for CVE where it says you know those that are able to think um, more critically about information that they receive and about events and and um, as opposed to those that that tend to to look at the world in in, in you know black and white or more black and white manner, those that are more critical tend to be less vulnerable or less susceptible to um, to extremist ideologies in general, right? Um, but uh, so, so that's one thing, and, and I think that's that's important because there's so much that supports that idea, and and then that would go in the opposite direction of. The polarization that you were talking about, which we are, you know, seeing, we're also seeing this quite a bit in the U.S. We have been seeing it over the, the last two years. So, I mean, you know, that's that's just one of the one of the um, you know initial uh, suggestions that are starting to be discussed. And I would say starting. I mean, the, you know, the whole critical thinking has you know a bit of a longer history, but with books like *The Calling of the American Mind* and, and similar books, which are written. You know, by, by psychologists essentially, um, and identity theorists. Um, it, it, this seems to be really the, the core of the problem. Look, you're not going to make everything else go away. You're not going to make the complexity go away. You're not going to make these identity issues go away because we all go through them. And actually, there are several um, aspects of the hyper-globalized world right now that you're experiencing. You being, you know, that individual going through their the formative you know, identity phase, right, in their life, that is not going to change. It's not going to go away, right? So either your response is going to be that you increasingly try to not only police others' behaviors and ideas and your own through adopting an ideology that simplifies everything because you can't deal with it, and, and that typically is what leads to, you know, extremism and polarization, or, you know, you learn how to find yourself in it, accepting that you're never going to fully be able to, to take in everything, to agree with everything and everyone, uh, to necessarily understand everything, but to find your space, you know, within this mess um, by being more reflective, um, by being more, you know, by being able to process information in a way that is not, that doesn't require of you to think in categorical boxes, you know, for want of a better term. Um, so that was, you know, I, I think that's, 
you know, that's, that's a suggestion just based on some of my own reading into this from, from, from the, uh, you know, counter terrorism or ca countering violent extremism perspective. Uh, I don't know if any, if, if any of you have, you know, other ideas um, about this. Yeah, it seems to me that uh, one, one, I don't know about issue per se, but one motivator for people is definitely to achieve some sort of cognitive consonance, which is the opposite of dissonance. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I like how you mentioned being able to contend with opposing ideas, mm -hmm. um, really reconciling different ways of looking at the world and living life. I think that's, that's very important uh, just to be able to tolerate it, you know, mm -hmm. because there is actually a bit of a paradox with tolerance in the sense of should we tolerate intolerance? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. this, the, the more we talk about this, the more it just seems to become more and more complex, but yet also more enlightening. So I, I'm really appreciating the direction this has gone so far. Right. Yeah, to to totally agree. Anybody else have any ideas how to solve this mess? Mm -hmm. How do we stop them from radicalizing? I mean, we've just touched on yeah, right. one, I mean, the identity aspect of radicalization is just one. Yeah, <laughs> and I think and it's very important. I think it's very important. You it know? is. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, there, there are so many other, uh, when we talk about countering violent extremism and whatnot initiatives, there's so much that comes into it beyond just the end of it. So, you, you know, we typically look at what are the factors that operate on these different levels and we have to work on them simultaneously um, because you're not just gonna solve the problem. You can't ask too much of the individual when everything else around that individual is, is, is not, all the other issues aren't being addressed, right? Um, you know, and again, contextually, it's very different. You can't compare the lived reality and experience of somebody in Gaza, um, for example, right? Um, with, uh, with somebody who is relatively well-off, educated, living somewhere in, you know, Belgium, uh, who nevertheless decides to. So I, I think there are similarities and there are differences, um, but they, there, there seem to be many, um, you know, there are parallels for sure um, in, 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 these, in these processes. But in some cases, don't get me wrong. I mean, in some cases, I think politics is a, is a, much, um, is a much more present motivating factor just by virtue of the fact, I mean, when, if you're in a conflict zone and you're personally impacted you know, by that conflict, then, you know, naturally that's going to be one of the main most present motivating factors. So I'm not, um, you know, neglect, I don't want to, to seem like I'm neglecting this, but again, and I guess this is a caveat I should have put up front, you know, a lot of what I've worked on and a lot of what we're talking about are, is, is very specific to the radicalization process within sort of Western democratic, you know, secular uh, contexts, which are very different than conflict zones, which also, again, similarities, but also have you know, other factors that trump the, um, um, some of the identities we've been talking about. So there, there's a bit of, I, I kind of feel there's a bit of a spoiled, I feel like the radicals here are spoiled because did, did, I think we talked about Maslow's hierarchy, Gary, right? So, so the Maslow's hierarchy, I can't remember if it was inverted or not. Anyway, it was, oh, yeah. it was yeah. oh no, no, it was, it was like this, it was a proper pyramid because, you know, you kind of have the basic needs that you need to meet. And then, you know, the better off your situation becomes, you start worrying of, you know, about higher order needs, like, you know, self-esteem, right. And self-actualization, which is really a luxury because in many conflict zones are still worried about the most basic levels. And that's really, and that's where, you know, earlier I said, poverty does play a role. Sure. In some con conflict, um, settings, for example, in Africa, you see a much more economic element of perhaps joining groups, not necessarily ideological radicalization, it has the same outcome, though, if the person is joining the group because they're causing harm. But you see that play a much larger role because they're still at these lower levels, right, um, of needs compared to the kids, you know, in countries like the US or the West, where they're really a lot of what we've been talking about today is a more spoiled um, upper Maslow's hierarchy needs of, you know, the, they're not being met. And so we actually turn more and more to, in some cases, not all, to these groups in order to, to have these needs met because they're not being met because of our experiences in these societies. Um, so they're in a far better position, right? I mean, they're like the, um, yeah, it's almost like first world radicalization, I guess would be a good, <laughs> would be a good term, first world radicalization issues. Um, but, uh, 
the, the, the issue the, the issue still seems to be the same actually and i i really love the initial suggestions that you offered as to how we could go about solving this problem in the context of our own lives as i guess first world uh individuals who are to whatever degree in our own ways susceptible to these problems that we uh, we're discussing right now which is that learn to contend with complexity and to think critically and to reflect on contradictions without succumbing to black and white ways of thinking. And this really ties into the psychological level of analysis as well, because one of the things that we uh, tend to practice in psychotherapy with our patients is showing them that or making, providing the conditions to make it possible for them to experience often mutually incompatible emotional states as, yeah. as like compatible essentially, or uh, as, them be as it being possible for them to be co-present despite their <laughs> incompatibility maybe that's the better way to uh talk about it like mm -hmm. you might you might get someone who is deeply in love with their partner but every time their partner does something wrong angers them let's say they get angry and they forget about they're like now i'm angry at you you're the worst person ever you're not lovable anymore mm -hmm. or um you just did something that made me feel rejected you're again, not lovable anymore. I hate you now, right? But that's, that's, that's kind of a non sequitur. The more you dwell with that problem because it's possible to, and this is where the real transformative moment happens in therapy where your patient notices, right? That the person that they love has done something to disappoint them or anger them or whatever. And they get angry or disappointed but they still know that they deeply love this person. Mm -hmm. that it's possible to love you and be disappointed at you yeah. once and just because i'm disappointed in you or, or or hurt by you or anything like that doesn't mean that i have to solve this problem in an absolutist sort of fashion mm -hmm. which then brings me to another sort of point which might be interesting to think about that a lot of the time i feel like we we tend to have a strong um sense of urgency around solving our problems the moment a problem arises, the moment we feel anxious or upset, we want to do everything we can to make the upsetness or sadness or anxiety to go away. Mm -hmm. So it's a very like urgent sort of problem solving attitude or mindset that takes over. And you can make the case that with this kind of radicalization, part of what fuels that is the inability to sort of pace yourself and to notice what's going on, but instead to rush in to try to solve the problem at its cause in a sense, which hardly ever actually solves the problem. All mm -hmm. you're doing there is actually trying to solve your, resolve your own anxieties, not mm -hmm. the problem itself. Right, right. Instead, yeah. it might be interesting to think about all these problems as life problems. Like these are things I'm gonna be seeing and encountering till the day that I die. So mm -hmm. might as well just see what happens and see if I can learn something more worthwhile about it than just to make my anxieties go away. Mm -hmm. I can handle the anxiety. I just need to learn how to do it. Or maybe mm -hmm. I just need to learn that I can do it because mm -hmm. maybe what I'm trying to avoid so desperately is the anxiety that I, I don't believe that I haven't learned yet that I can handle, but I have it in me. I just need to learn how to do that. And mm -hmm. maybe that's what, uh, th that's what I was hearing in what you were saying, like the mm -hmm. psychological element of it, cultivating the virtue of not knowing, which goes back to another theme that's been pervading through our different episodes with um, the different guest speakers that we've had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And I think, yeah, a lot of the, 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 the texts, the books I was referencing, um, they really make this point, uh, you know, I mean, and, and it kind of brings to mind a conversation I had with a, one of my best friends recently. Um, she's, she's in corporate, she's not an academic, but, uh, you know, she'd started, you know, seeing that herself. I think, you know, I think a lot of people that a lot of people now do turn to therapy, different kinds of therapies to deal with these issues. And I think depending on the, on the kind of therapist you go to, they give you very different um, resources. Um, I'm, I'm, and it depends on this, you know, the form, what, what form of therapy are you actually administering? But um, she was talking about, you know, some forms of therapy and, and some approaches nowadays uh, seem to be very, they seem to be all about indulging in, in your anxieties, indulging in your emotions, what upsets you, but not really giving you the tools to be able to manage these these anxieties. So it, we're and I tend to and this was her this was this was her saying this, but I, I found it very interesting because I tend to agree. Like, you know, it's it's all about you have the right to feel feel feel, 
what you want to feel. Um, and it's, you're absolutely right, but then you're left at that point. Right. Um, so what, where do you go after that? Right. Yeah. So and everybody's indulging and then they're, and then they become overwhelmed because that's where it ends. And there isn't, I think a lot of, it's not only that, and this is not just young people. I think a lot of people, you know, we all have anxieties, you know, from time to time, we all have issues. And, but the, 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 I think the key is really learning how to not only like manage them, but to realize that they're going to be like, these things are going to happen. You can't control it. And I think this is where, this is what interest, interested me and interests me a lot about focusing on the individual on this this concept of resilience, which has come up more recently in scholarship on responses to, to, to extremism and how to manage it is look, if you actually look at all of the factors that produce or that are conducive to radicalization as per profiles of radicals about, I don't know what percentage, a significant percentage is A, out of the control of the individual, um, off B, and, and oftentimes is related to circumstances or specific um, issues that are never going to be resolved or unlikely to be resolved in the short term and that are likely to recur. So a lot of what radicals are dealing with is out of their control, but the only thing they can really control is themselves and how they respond to the situation and how they perceive of the situation and how they handle it, right? In many cases, again, conflict zones are, are very different. Okay, so I, I appreciate that in some circumstances, it's not that easy to put that out there. But with what we've been talking about today, it really is, you know, look, so you were, you know, so you're discriminated against. Well, guess what? There's always going to be assholes out there that are not going to like you. Mind, excuse my French, but, you know, that are not, that are not going to, to like you. And you were going to, you know, it's, it's, it would be nice if the whole world was nice people who didn't have, um, you know, nasty ideas about where you come from or, but it, you know, it's going to happen. So if that's one source of your grievance, um, it, it, it's beyond your control. And, you know, it's likely that you might, um, you, you will run into it. You will run into people whose ideas you don't like, even if they're not about you. We see this, I mean, we're seeing this currently with the two sides in the current Palestine-Israel conflict. And, and it's very, you know, um, how do you deal with it? And you, and you see that in, in how these, just in this conflict, the both sides, it gets so heated and there's an inability to say, okay, this is what I think. Um, I appreciate, you know, I respect that you have a different opinion. I disagree with you. Let's, let's talk about it. It's always about shouting the other side down. So there's, there's this, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's this increasing tendency to want to just cancel out all the other noise that, 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 that presents some kind of, you know, cognitive dissonance, I guess, is, is, is one of the, the terms that was brought up, I agree, but just discomfort. And we're increasingly uncomfortable, right? Um, in ways that are not, sustain it's not sustainable. This approach is not sustainable because you will always be uncomfortable. Um, and so I think a big part of it is, is building resilience in individuals, but it also goes back to, you know, the universities, the classroom, um, politics, you know, what, what is being encouraged, you know, what are the narratives um, that are being taught um, and that are, that are proliferating, you know, in, in societies and proliferating in political circles when it comes to, you know, issues which can be very di divisive, like can really divide people, um, or alternatively, um, you know, can actually bring them together notwithstanding their differences. Um, and so, and, and, and this is, again, this is just a common theme that, that I see a lot. Um, it's, you, you have to learn how to deal with it because guess what? It's, life isn't supposed to be, you know, as it's never gonna go as you want it. And the more that you try as an individual or a group to make it that way, um, the more that society starts falling apart because you're, it necessarily means you're going to try to impose one specific way of life or idea on another group and then it just unravels. And that's, that's how groups become more extreme as they become more polarized and that's where violence erupts. So, so yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, so I totally, I totally agree. I think that's, um, I wish that was something that we talked about more because it's so Me too, yeah. interesting, you know? Well, uh, I, I, I mean, I don't think this conversation would end in a natural way because it's. <laughs> yeah, I don't want it to. 
I mean, I, I was going to bring up safe spaces now, but let's. <laughs> oh God. Uh, well, about that. No, you know what? <laughs> because I think we should have a part two. Uh, yeah, agreed. We, we... Let's pick up. Let's pick up. Um, let's pick up safe spaces in part two. <laughs> Sounds good. Going That's on. the solution. The solution. Yeah. We'll find it in there. Yeah. Sounds yeah. good to me. Right. Security and um, how the experience of insecurity shows up in processes of radicalization and ideological polarization, and also the question of trust, interpersonal and social trust. Because I, I mean, I, I can imagine how if someone is debating your right to live, for example, you're far less likely to feel secure about taking that up as a matter of argumentative theoretical debate. Yeah. You're, you're more likely to act out or, or react, right? Yeah, yes. So that's an interesting dynamic I would love to explore sure. um, for of us. Um, yeah. And I also like, I mean, it's still resonating with me, the idea that resisting our tendency to resort to ideological means of managing anxiety, mm -hmm. right? um, that's essentially the antidote to ideological polarization, just be, being able to tolerate anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I had much more to say about that, like, Five ten minutes ago, when we were talking about this, but um, how about this? Let me pause for a moment. If anyone else has anything to add, and then we could uh, start closing up, um, ra wrapping up, actually, because we've been going at it for over an hour at this point. Sounds good to me. Sounds good. Yeah. Any, no anxiety there to manage right now. <laughs> no, not right now. Okay. Nope. Okay, well, uh, I've got a strong need for closure at this point. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Ah. <laughs> okay, uh, well, um, Dina, as you already know, we, we've got a bit of a tradition that at the, every, uh, at the end of every episode, we ask our guest speakers um, a question. And that question is, if you could travel back in time and meet uh, your younger self, what would you say to yourself? What would you want yourself to know? You know, I thought about this, but this question was somehow formatted differently um, <laughs> in, in my mind. I, it, it, the one thing I thought when I, when I was reflecting on this, when you asked it of me about a month ago was, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, continue, I, I, would, I would say continue making decisions and stick to them. And I think, I think if there's, I guess if that's one lesson I would give, I think it's so important to a friend of my a friend friend of mine and I always joke about it and we call it executive executive decision. And it's always like it's it's I'm talking about big decisions, right? And big decisions that might sound or might feel at first to be that require a lot of, of courage. Um, but I don't I don't regret the ones I made back then. And I think it's always the decisions that require courage and require you to step out of your comfort zone that that promote the largest growth. I don't think I would be where I am today if I wouldn't have made difficult decisions, but committed to them and just, just do it, you know, if it feels right. And it's, you know, it doesn't matter how, you know, difficult it might be. And I guess in the context of radicalization, this, it perhaps is not the best advice. <laughs> you know, if it feels right to join that forest organization. It might be, you know, but no, I mean. <laughs> no, I mean, I can see, I can see. Um, what you're saying as being the antidote to radicalization actually and so far as radicalization could be construed as a form of escapism and self-deception yeah uh, where it's motivated by a lack of belief and conviction in one's own self to find a way to be good and to do what's right uh despite the um terrors maybe or, or difficulties that you're faced with socially yeah. interpersonally and whatnot I mean, stepping out of the comfort zone. I think it's. I think sometimes it's very difficult to do it, and sometimes you know, fear of the unknown for most people prevents them from stepping out and doing something which is unknown. But um, I would say, you know, and, and there are many times when I, sh I I look back and I think I should have done this earlier, and I wish I had, but I was so comfortable where I was that I didn't. And so there are some decisions I I, I have made which I, I'm very happy about. There are some things which I only started recently doing which I wish I would have done sooner, you know, and because I just was- Like this podcast, right? Like this, like this podcast. <laughs> I love podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, this, was, this was fantastic. I mean, but hey, I see I jumped right onto that. I mean, you know, our student 
Yeah, Tatiana said, do it. I said, I'll do it. Um, so uh, even though I was quite anxious about it, but um, but like running in a group, running with a run club, I've recently joined a run club. It's, it's very, might seem very insignificant, but I've been running since I was 15 or 16. And over the past six, seven months, just because of joining the run club, I, and because of the motivation and support I've gotten from them, I've gone much, much further in my running. I've set new, more new PRs in the last seven months than I have in the, in the past 17, 18 years. So awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. and it's, it's, it's fantastic. And I, you know, and they've, I don't know, fortunately or unfortunately, they're ultra runners. So, you know, that stuff gets addictive. They call it type two fun, right? Which is like, you know, you're going to do this 50 mile or you've never <laughs> run that long before. You're, you're gonna, it's going to be great. You're going to have fun. <laughs> but let's talk, let's talk a bit about the pain cave. And I'm like, that doesn't sound, that doesn't sound <laughs> pain awesome. cave. That's classic. It doesn't sound like fun. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, um, but things, so it's big things, small things, but yeah, I think it is stepping out the, the, the comfort zone and be intellectually curious. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what, uh, you know, in speaking of the little things that we can do in, as individuals for others, I think, I think it really is a privilege to be able to teach because that's what I try to do for my students. I don't try to tell them what's right or what's wrong. You know, I teach if they have questions, I answer their questions. It's, there's certainly influence to be had there, but you know, I want them to kind of, as much as possible, I try to get them to question, you know, some, some, of, some of the more conventional ideas they might have about things, not saying that it's ne they're necessarily wrong. Sometimes they, they're not altogether right. Um, so just this idea of be curious, you know, why, you know, why do you, why do you say this? Do you have an informed opinion about this or are you just parroting what somebody else said because that's what you, and, and I'm, I, and I'm trying not to be judgmental because I was like that at their age too. Um, but to, you know, but go on and, and really be curious about, you know, don't just accept things at face value. Um, but ask, you know, ask questions and be really ready to, to open up and listen to the other side, because as much as you might not like it, as much as you might come out the other end of that, you know, and see, you know, I listen to the other side, I listen to their ideas, I'm still not interested, do it. You know, at least you still know, at least you know why and, and have an argument for that. So that's what I would say to my own self. And I think I've done, okay. Okay. I love your answer. And um, especially the last part about being intellectually cur curious. Uh, th there is a kind of encouragement there that I'm hearing in, in your message. Um, and it, I think it's based in fact, actually, in that if you close yourself off against the terrible unknown, and a lot about the unknown can be terrible, right? Because the unknown is where all the monsters lurk that can actually harm you. But at the same time, the unknown is also the place where rewards of unimaginable worth also lie by definition, because, right? Mm -hmm. th there are things that are good that you didn't know even existed. So by closing yourself off uh, to the terrible unknown, you're also closing yourself off um, from the benevolent unknown and the, and the meaningful unknown, I would say. And being yeah. intellectually cur curious requires a kind of courage, right? So that you can step out of your comfort zone, just as you were saying, open yourself up to a degree of risk so that you could also discover something new and worthwhile. And if you do that well enough along the way, you'll, you'll, you'll find yourself exactly where you should be. And it's not going to be easy. It's not meant to be easy. It's not, it's not meant to be free from pain or anxiety or anything like that. No. And uh, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and meet, speak to other people um, from different backgrounds. From different, I think there, there's one thing that, I, that I, I'd say I'm most blessed to, to, to have been able to do over until to this point is living in different countries, being exposed to different ideas, different people, um, you know, putting personal experiences and, and, and faces to people that belong to, as opposed to just hearing about them. Um, so if that's a possibility, I'd say keep doing that because that's, it's changed me a lot. I mean, I was far more, I was very black and white in some of my views when I started this, this journey, really. Um, and I think I've softened up quite a bit in some of my views, and I and I and I, and I have become, to some degree, also a little more tolerant of intolerances. Um, or intolerance is, is, is certainly saying, um, and which is not necessarily a bad thing. I think to some extent we have to be also tolerant of 
just this is reality. You're not going to change it um, in some cases. And okay, and, and actually, it's it's far more complex than I thought it was. And I think that's very very important. So yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, that was a wonderful response. Um, again, I, I, I find myself not wanting to stop, but alas. <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much for having me. This was fun. I was, I was quite anxious to begin with, actually. But uh, this, was, this was fun. I had a really good time. Yeah, likewise. I'm well spent, and it was lovely meeting all of, meeting, seeing you again, Gary, meeting you, Jill and Suraj. So um, yeah, likewise. definitely think of a part two where we start with safe spaces. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, thank, thanks for coming here, Dina. Again, uh, th this was amazing. And um, for all of our viewers, we'll uh, put a link somewhere in the bio to the paper that we kept referencing over and over again uh, that Dina published in 2013, I believe, on social identity theory and uh, radicalization. Um, and stay tuned for the next episode, whenever that might be. So thanks again, and bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Take care. Bye.